Proceedings in Sochi were delayed when some opposition delegates refused to leave the airport. Now, they were angry over the display of Syrian regime flags have now returned to Turkey, where they're based. The main opposition group, the Syrian Negotiation Commission, boycotted the talks altogether. The Turkish delegation says it will represent them at the summit. Now, in a closing statement, it was announced that the conference members would set up a 150-member committee to reform the Syrian constitution. All of the latest on this, our Turkey political correspondent Andrew Hopkins is in Sochi at the talks and joins us now live. Andrew, good to speak to you. So, we've had this final statement uh, come out. What did it say? Yeah, Kamali, there's a statement which includes 12 commitments for the future of Syria. They're actually very similar to some of the issues, the commitments that have been discussed already at the United Nations in Geneva. And if you look at a lot of them in isolation, they're very uncontroversial. They're things like um, commitments to the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Syria, that it should be a democratic and non-sectarian state, and that only the people should decide their future through the ballot box. However, uh, if you if you talk to some of the opposition, I think you will find that they can have a lot of scepticism about what is, what is contained in this document, especially um, viewing the recent record of the Syrian regime and the, its close ally Russia, because they will be wary about whether these two sides can actually commit themselves to things like protecting human rights, to have a unified and meritocratic army. And I think that all connects as well to one of the opening statements of this, uh, these commitments, which is it says that this Congress represents all parts of Syrian society. And I think many parts of the opposition who are boycotting this conference will say that this Congress doesn't represent those people. And maybe one extra thing to, to take note of as well, this document commits to uh, representation of 30% uh, women in government structures and uh, decision-making uh, bodies in future in Syria. It'll be interesting to see how they came at that uh, exact figure seeing as women make up about 50, 51 percent of the global population. I mean, on the face of it, Andrew, it seems like progress, of course, but as you rightly say, without the main opposition group being there, it's going to be difficult for this to actually go into effect. Uh, and this interesting line as well about them changing the constitution, without having an opposition there to agree to this, how on earth is that going to work? Yeah, well, what they say about this new constitutional committee is they're going to have a range of delegates on it. They're going to have uh, members of the regime. They're going to have members of the opposition, also people representing different ethnic groups and also different religions inside Syria. And they're all going to uh, discuss it un under the auspices of the United Nations, under uh, Security Council Resolution 2254, which was made in 2015, that was to create a new constitution, uh, credible governance in Syria and elections within 18 months. So they are looking to uh, combine this process with the United Nations. Now, one more interesting part of this is they want the UN envoy to Syria, Stefan de Mistura, to join this committee. They're going to ask him if he can take his place on it. And it does show you now that Russia and the regime and the three countries that are behind this Astana process, Russia, Turkey and, and Iran, are quite concerned that they want this to have some kind of international legitimacy under international law. Whatever can be agreed in future will have the acceptance of the international community. Probably the only way it's going to work. Andrew, in Sochi, thank you for now.